Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, which is going to be with uh, my very special guest, Rachel uh, Jones-Ross, who I shall introduce uh, shortly after we cover a few housekeeping things. So there's a lot of you in the webinar today. It's actually a, a one of the biggest we've had. So it's important you guys uh, follow the rules. Um, so as usual, there's going to be probably a maximum of 60 minutes today, but we might go longer. So depending how, uh, how everything goes and so on and so forth, uh, we might extend that for another 15, 20 minutes or, or something like that. We shall see how it goes. Uh, we are recording this webinar as well. So if you want to watch it again, uh, you can do so on our normal uh, channels, which is over on YouTube uh, and our learning hub as well. And you'll get an email tomorrow, which will show you exactly how to uh, find that. Now, the really important bits. You've all discovered the chat room, which is great. So it's nice to see such uh, an international crowd uh, from all over the place. And the chat room's great for talking amongst yourselves, uh, saying hi to me, heckling us, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the important thing is, if you want to ask a question, it's best to do that within the Q&A tab, because if you put it in the chat room, it'll just get lost, I'm afraid. So if you want to ask a question, put it in the Q&A tab, and then that way I will be able to find it a little bit um, easier. Um, it's also important to note that, again, as there is a lot of you, uh, please try to keep your questions on today's subject as well. And also, please don't be offended if we don't get to every single uh, question as well. But we shall do our best to um, answer uh, the most pertinent ones as well. Um, if chatting and asking questions is not your thing, that's fine. You can hide the chat room just by clicking the little down arrow in the top right hand corner. Um, and the last thing to mention is, I'll just bring Rachel on screen shortly in a second, is that guests on the webinar engine come via Skype too. Um, I'm coming directly sort of into the webinar engine, so my webcam quality uh, is going to be much higher than, than Rachel's because I'm also on a DSLR as well. Um, so there will be a difference between my feed and Rachel's feed, but you'll be able to see her screen uh, perfectly clearly and everything as well. Um, there's loads of internet traffic in the world at the moment, as you can imagine. Um, so let's just keep our fingers crossed for smooth sailing that we can stream everything as we wish. So that's quite enough of me rabbiting on. Uh, I'm going to bring Rachel on screen right now. So Rachel, you're now on screen. So and you're sitting over Hi, in everybody. Calgary, correct? Yes, I am. It's still winter here. It's been snowing and the last time I was out it was minus 20. Nice. Celsius. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so fairly chilly then. Um, so yes. uh, uh, today we are doing this webinar a bit differently because normally it's just me talking and editing in Capture One. But what I thought uh, today would be good uh, purely because also I know nothing about shooting nightscapes and astrophotography at all. Uh, so it's great that you're here to not only educate everyone else, but educate me. Um, but I thought there's no point in just editing astro shots in Capture One, um, because the actual process of capturing the shot is just as important, if not more important, uh, than yeah. the editing stage. <clears throat> so what sure. I asked you to do was to kind of talk actually quite in depth about that part, as well as just doing Capture One. So we're going to spend... I don't know how long we, we've tried to estimate, but the first part, at least talking about the planning stage and the various other bits and pieces. So depends on how many stories I end up telling. Yeah, so and stories if, if I'm well. telling too many stories, you can just, you know, tell me to wrap it up a little bit and I'll try and shorten it. Exactly. So um, I'm going to put uh, us shrunk down or we're going to hide. I'm going to hide our faces in a second. And uh, I will let you take it away with uh, the first part that you wanted to talk about. And as I said, guys and girls, if you have questions, pop them in the, uh, uh, the Q&A tab and then we should do our best. All right, All right. over to you, Rachel. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, David. You've got such a soothing broadcaster voice. I hope that, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that my voice translates just as well online. I think so. Um, <laughs> let's see. So night photography was definitely my first love. Um, there's something really magical for me about clicking that shutter and seeing an image on the back of my screen that I don't get to see with my eyes. I mean, yeah, we can look up at the stars and we can see that cluster of twinkly bits that is the Milky Way, but 
the stuff that we don't get to see that our cameras can capture are all the gases and the nebulosity and all that intricate detail. And fun science fact, <laughs> uh, unless the light from like the moon or light pollution or um, dancing light of the aurora is really bright, we don't get to see in color either because there's not enough light to stimulate the photoreceptors in our eyes that perceive the world in color. So in low light situations at night, we rely on our peripheral visual system, our rods, and they're really adept at detecting movement, but they only allow us to see the world in black and white. Our cameras don't have these kinds of limitations. Their sensitivity to light allows us to perceive our world far beyond what the human eye can see. And for me, clicking that shutter is like pulling back a curtain and peering into the universe. That's how I felt the very first time I ever um, took my very first night shot. And I still feel that way every single time I'm out there. Um, yeah, so it definitely sounds romantic to spend all these nights under the stars. Actually, last year I took on a project to spend 100 nights under the stars. Um, and there's definitely elements of romance that come with that. I remember one time in particular, I um, was out with a friend, Dan Cormier, and we had decided to do a paddle trip out to Spirit Island in Jasper National Park. But we got away super late, and um, by the time that we were anywhere near our campsite, it was a 13-kilometer paddle. It was really dark. The lake was perfectly flat, perfectly still, and the stars were shining so bright and they were reflecting in the water. And every time I moved the paddle, it looked like I was scooping up stars. And I hope I never ever forget moments like that. <laughs> but there's a lot of other moments too. Um, I have definitely been cold in ways that I could never have imagined being cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can imagine, and... I was thinking a hundred nights under the stars is just really cold more than anything well, else. I do live in Calgary, so, you know, a lot of what I do, I'm, I'm also, I love um, winter. So I never used to love winter until I started photography, but I absolutely love winter. I think it's like the pillowy snow and all the icy foregrounds and stuff, like that's what really does it for me. So um, I spend a lot of time outside in the winter. Um, and you can imagine with 100 nights under the stars, or at least the goal being 100 nights under the stars, I think I spent about 200 nights under the clouds. Um, I didn't sleep very much. I don't think I've still recovered from that. Like, I can pretty much fall asleep anytime, anywhere. I do have my coffee with me today, though, so good. we're good. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you can imagine, you know, it's not always very comfortable. It can be cold. There's an element of fatigue that leaves me feeling like the undead. Um, and night photography presents a whole host of technical challenges that really require a certain amount of familiarity with your camera and comfort to be able to shoot in the dark. Um, and the planning that goes into it is often really different than um, anything you do during the day. It's so seldom that you get to just sort of rock up to a location, plunk your camera down and get some kind of magical shot all in one single image. Um, so there's a lot of planning that goes into it and I will get to that. Um, I did not name myself the uh, Ice Queen or Queen of the North, but I have had clients that have uh, given me such nicknames. So I thought I'd play a quick little clip for you. Hello. I don't know if you can hear it really well. Oops. <laughs> and then I just I just moved the slide. I was looking for the volume button. Hello, hello. Vermilion Lake. It's a little chilly out. Hello, look at so these diva so lashes. Diva lashes. <laughs> great, great workshop by the Ice Queen, <laughs> who's trying to convert us all into ice princesses. Yeah, it is a little quiet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, where, sometimes where was, we're out where there. Where was that taken, Rachel? Um, that was at Vermilion Lakes. So we, it was during a workshop, I had a group out and it got really cold. Luckily Vermilion Lakes is, you know, a place where you can kind of pull up and get out of the car and then go back to the car if you get cold. So um, we were out there in, I think it was minus 33 Celsius yes. that night. And yeah, got some really great images, but uh, it's, it's funny when you come back to the car and like my hair is turned white and I've got like, frosty eyelashes and stuff like that. Um, definitely spend a lot of nights in the cold. 
<laughs> so today what I am hoping to do is um, cover sort of everything that you might want to know, um, maybe not super in depth, but you know, how I plan for and prepare a night shoot, um, some of the settings that I might go to, um, the ways that I think about night photography, gear that I use, it's kind of an all encompassing thing. I have been told that my introduction to night photography is a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, so not to worry, as Dave has said, this session will be recorded and, yep. and posted for future viewing. And also I do offer online mentorship. Um, so this is a chance to work with me one-on-one -on -one and work through any of the concepts that we're talking about here today in more detail or really anything that you want to cover on photography from social media to the business side of it. But anyway, that's all um, more details on that on my website at astralisphotography.com. Okay, so the fun part. Um, the biggest challenge when we're doing any kind of night photography, obviously, is that we don't have any light. Um, and that, I'm going to put that little caveat out there that we may have moonlight or we may have aurora and all of those things make a difference. But let's imagine that we're going to go out and we're going to shoot the Milky Way. Chances are we're going to wait for darker skies. We're going to want to have minimal moonlight because we don't want the moonlight to flood out the stars. So right away we know that we're going to be working at wide open apertures. Typically this is like f2.8. Um, it might be f4. The shot I'm going to work with you on today to the editing is an f4. And what happens when we have really wide aperture, as lots of you probably know, is that we have a really shallow depth of field, which is awesome if we're doing portrait photography because that allows us to isolate our subject. Um, you know, everything kind of like right near your focal point is going to be in focus, but the background is going to be blurred out. Well, we don't want that in landscape photography. So if we're focused on our foreground, we don't want the stars to be blurry. Or if we're focused on the stars, we don't want our foreground to be blurry. But because these wide apertures are have really shallow depth of field, we have to get creative about how we're going to overcome that kind of challenge. Um, the first one is to focus stack. Focus stacking is just taking multiple images um, at different focal points and then blending those together. And again, the image that I I'm going to work through today is a focus stacked image. Um, so um, with these wide open apertures, we're going to have a very blurry ba background. Um, if we were able to shoot at f8 or f11, which sometimes happens at night, then we would need less uh, focal points. We would need less focus stacking, depending on how close we are to our foreground. That's always like the biggest determinant of how much focus stacking we need to do. If my if my lens is like, you know, right up next to something, then that is a very short focal distance and everything behind it is going to be very blurry. So these are the things that we have to think about when we're doing night photography and um, that we're often working at wide open apertures with really shallow depth of field. Um, and P.S. My son made me this infographic yesterday, which <laughs> I thought was pretty cool. Um, he's uh, 19 and so hence the dragons and knights. <laughs> so what's the what's the argument against just not shooting a, um, a narrow aperture and just lengthening your exposure time to now this is showing my ignorance because I don't know what typically what uh, exposure times you're running to so mm -hmm. so what what would be a typical exposure time fully open I would I would ask okay so um, all right that's a really good question um, Typical is most people's cameras will op have um, the option to open the shutter for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and often that's not sufficient to get a really well exposed image. Um, and, and, like on a really dark night, even at 2.8, you might not get a really well exposed image at 30 seconds. Right. So then you can use a trigger and you can put it in bulb mode and you can take much longer exposures. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really good option as well. So uh, I'm going to run through some examples and I'll give you an idea of kind of what things look like at, you know, with moonlight or with other, other sources of light or when there's no light and kind of what um, apertures I end up working at. And I guess I'm probably, it is I'm, really I'm probably thinking ahead, but I guess if you're 
exposure time is then too long if you're going like 40 minutes or half an hour or 10 minutes uh, then you run the risk of stars being blurry then i suppose which is what you don't want okay so that's a whole that's a whole other thing oh, i'm going um, too fast <laughs> <laughs> yeah we are going too fast i just wanted to start with you know thinking wrapping our heads around shallow depth of field um yeah, yeah we can definitely use um, different apertures, those narrower apertures that are going to let in less light, which means our shutter would have to be open longer. Um, that also runs the risk of having hot pixels in our image mm -hmm. um, or, you know, uh, being hard on the sensor. Not so much at minus 20 in the Canadian no, Rockies or minus 32 cool. in the yeah. Canadian Rockies, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I'll run through some examples okay. and I'll just keep talking about it and hopefully it kind of gels towards the end after we've gone through lots of this stuff. Cool. Okay. So when I'm shooting, I'm always shooting with um, processing in mind. So I'm always thinking about how am I going to get the best out of this image? This particular image um, was actually just shot like about a month ago um, with Helen in Iceland. I hope you're on Helen and you can see. Um, but, you know, this is one of those cases where we had, you know, planned to shoot and we were planning on shooting the Aurora from ice caves and we'd gone out and done all of our homework and scouted compositions and then the clouds rolled in and we had to drive for eight hours to go and find a new location. And luckily we had lots of moonlight to work with. It was nearly a full moon and the light from the Aurora was also really bright. So when I rocked up to this location, I was able to get a single shot. This is a single shot. Um, and everything is really well exposed. Um, and I shot it at f8. So this is um, a case where you can use a narrower aperture. And the exposure time, although I don't remember right off the top of my head, I think it was about two seconds. Um, you want exposure times to be shorter when you're um, photographing the aurora, because otherwise, if the exposure is really long, it'll just look like a big green blob all the way across the image. Right. So to get that detail, you need shorter exposures. Now, if it was a really dark night, I'd probably be shooting this at f2.8. So I'll keep talking about it, and we'll keep going over it. Um, anyway, Helen likes to tease me about this one because she says I forced her to drive for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think she was pretty happy with the end result, too. So anyway, I'm always thinking about processing. And this was one of those lucky shots where I could do it all in a single shot. So there's kind of three ways that I think about um, shooting night nightscapes. One is a single exposure, like you just saw, and like this image. Um, typically, single exposures are possible if we have lots of light, nothing in the immediate foreground right next to the camera, Reflections work really well because with a reflection, nobody's going to see that the the water has softer detail than the mountain because you would expect that. You would expect that um, just looking at it with your eyes that the water isn't going to be as sharp as the mountain. So, um, so this one worked. So this one it was shot at f two eight. There, this is in Vermilion Lakes. Um, near Banff and the ISO here is pretty low considering that it's a six second exposure. It's a six second exposure because I didn't want the stars to trail and I was at a longer focal length. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what my focal length was. And um, because of the light pollution in Banff, I was able to shoot this at 2500 ISO. Um, but this is really um, not something that's very common for me that I can get a shot in a single exposure. Usually it's some kind of blend. So um, when it comes to blends, um, blends can look like a lot of different things. They can be an exposure blend um, to get, say I want um, the image I'm going to work with later today when we get to editing was taken on a really dark night and my widest lens for this scene was a 12 millimeter, which was the perfect um, uh, focal length, but it's only an F4 lens. So combine a dark night with an F4 lens and I'm not getting much light into the camera. So what I had to do was shoot at really high ISO, which was 20,000, and then take multiple images. I took 20 and then I'm gonna stack them together for noise reduction. 
Um, this image was a similar approach. Um, I had some light from the aurora, but not a ton. Um, it ended up being a six second exposure. I stacked 20 images together for noise reduction. The aurora here wasn't as shapely as you might see in Iceland because in the Rockies, we have to have really strong aurora conditions to get those ribbons and stuff like that. So um, my stacking here didn't really affect the aurora any. It kind of looks the same in a single shot as it did in a, in a 20 images um, all taken together. And because I was shooting like, um, you know, trying to get the foreground at the same, you know, in the same session or whatever, um, my foreground was shot at f3.5 for 30 seconds. Would have loved for that to be longer. I would have loved for that to be at a narrower aperture. But I was working pretty quickly before the aurora disappeared, and that was sort of the best I could do um, with the conditions that I had, and it turned out pretty good. Um, so when I'm doing a blend, basically I'm putting my tripod down and I'm not moving the tripod. Uh, I'll take different focal points, so I'll take an image focused in the very near ground, um, maybe a little bit further, a little bit further from that. So it really depends on, again, um, what my aperture is and how much depth of field I have, uh, how many shots I end up having to take. And this particular image is also an exposure blend. So it's focus stacked and it's exposure blended. Um, there's you know, I had to have a shorter exposure for the stars so that the stars don't trail with the rotation of the Earth. Um, and I'll show you how to find the correct um, exposure for stars coming up shortly. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> and, <you. laughs> um, and then there's also, um, so then I wanted to get a longer exposure for the, the lodge here so that I could get more light on the ground. Um, and more light, you know, kind of coming into the scene so you can see more details. So this sky was shot at, I'm going to say six seconds or less. I don't remember anymore. The lodge was shot at 30 seconds and the foreground, um, the focus stacks in the foreground were also shot at 30 seconds. So all of this is done without moving my tripod and then I can bring it all into um, Photoshop later and blend them all together. Is that pretty clear so far? Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to pick up a couple of questions, which I think you've uh, answered mostly, um, which is great. So I can get rid of some of those <laughs> questions for sure. Um, typical ISO, I know you've, you've given us some of the, uh, you've shown the metadata on the shots, which is super, super helpful. But do you have an ISO that you tend to Okay, this is this is the one I'm going to try and hit. Is what I'm saying, and then you have to deviate yeah. either side depending on conditions. Yeah. yeah, so I usually start off at 3200 ISO because I am comfortable with noise reduction there. If I was shooting a single image and I wasn't stacking images for noise reduction, or if I was doing time lapse, uh, do quite a bit of time lapse, then I try not to go over 3200. I know you can push it higher. Lots of people push it to 6,400. That's just a preference for me. And um, if I'm going to be pushing my ISO, I'm probably going to be stacking for noise reduction. Right. And I'm probably going to be doing it at much higher ISOs than say 6,400. So yeah, a good starting place is 3,200 because it's a place that I'm comfortable with the noise. Um, and I always, I always try to shoot with printing in mind, um, you know, what would this look like in print? If I had to blow it up really big, would this noise be a problem? Um, would it be a distraction? Right. Or how can you deal with that? So, yeah, I guess everything always looks a hundred times, not worse is not the right word, but, but you know, pixel peeping at a hundred percent is very different from a, a large format print and so on. And, and, and yeah. what, what you can get away with as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before I move on to one more uh, category? Yeah, it's, uh, um, someone's cross with me because I covered up your picture with our faces, so I just had to move that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and... Excellent. I, I don't love my face being online anyway, so <laughs> look at the pictures. Just to understand the people watching, Rachel can't actually see what's on the screen, so she's actually, she's got a tough job. She's, she's talking blind, yeah. so I'm the one controlling yeah. the, the screen output and everything. Anyway. Um, I'm just talking to the the computer monitor, exactly. which is could, could be talking I mean, to it anyone. could be a sign of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think you're going to you're going to cover the applications that you use because there's quite a few questions on stacking and blending and all those kinds of things. Oh, yeah. We're going to we're going to get into we're that. Get Don't into worry. That. So, Baby step. <laughs> so hold hold uh, fire with those questions. We're we're going to learn about that and also your equipment. People asking a little bit about that as well. That's something yeah. we're also going to talk about too, isn't it? Yeah. I have a feeling we're going to run over an hour here. Yeah, folks. possibly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, continue. So, okay. <laughs> So our, our last category, um, this is something I don't do a lot of. I don't do a ton of composites. Composites are generally you take your foreground from one area, you might shoot the sky in another area, but and it could be at a different time, but basically you move your tripod. Um, I like composites. I think they're really pretty, but I don't do a lot of them because I don't have the same sort of emotional attachment to them that I do to a blend where I've sat there for literally hours and and got all the little bits of the image that I want to shoot. Um, so here's an example that is a composite, but um, it's also a, like a blue hour blend. And what I'm going to be running through today is a blue hour blend. I know this is like super interesting to lots of people. So this is the raw straight out of the camera image. Um, I ended up focus stacking this. I didn't pull in all of the images. So at some point, it's not going to be very sharp. But for this image, I shot the foreground during blue hour. It's um, I shot it at f11, ISO 100 for 30 seconds, and the exposure meter reads zero. So that's an important part of figuring out if your exposure um, is accurate. So this would be kind of ideal settings, but um, you'll see in the image I'm going to do today that I think my blue hour was really almost almost sunlight, um, where the, the sun hadn't come up over the horizon, but there was a lot of light. And I think it was, you know, one point some seconds, 1.6 seconds or something. Um, so what is good about blue hour is that we don't have any directional light. So I would typically do a blue hour blend on a really dark night where I don't have um, enough light to focus stack my foreground. Um, I'll wait for blue hour. I'll wait for that just enough light so that I can get it, but without having the directional light shadows or sunlight, you know, actually hitting the foreground. And then I would combine it with a sky. So um, I'm going to use I'm going to show you how to use photo pills to determine um, your shutter speed for accurate stars. But basically, I go to photo pills pretty much every time I'm shooting, um, unless I've memorized the values, which I have for some of my lenses. Um, I'm going to take a minimum of seven sequential images. The sequential part's really important. They need to be taken at the same interval. So um, I usually take 20 because I'm a perfectionist. I like to, I like, I'd rather have too many than not enough. Um, but I think seven is kind of the minimum. Um, so you would use photo pills to determine your accurate shutter for your stars. Um, and then um, adjust your ISO because sometimes photo pills will say if you want really accurate stars you're looking at say a three second exposure or a four second exposure so that's really really short and um, if we're only at 3200 ISO the image is going to be really dark you'll see even at 20,000 ISO at f4 my image is really dark so um, we're going to take a whole bunch of those they're going to be at an equal interval apart and then i use a program called starry landscape stacker to put all of those images together um, it's actually really easy to use unfortunately i can't show you that today because it's on my mac and i'm presenting on a pc so i've already stacked the image but it's it's really you just bring in your 20 images in a folder and you tell starry landscape stacker that these are the ones you want to stack you help it to find the sky, you help it to find the ground, and it'll create a mask for you. Um, so that's what I'm going to show you today as well. Well, not the starry part, but <laughs> it comes afterwards. Okay, so again, this is like a lot of information, um, and we're going to just keep moving through kind of like the whys of it all. Yeah, and it's a, well, as I say, we're recording it, so if, you know, anyone yeah. can just always <laughs> start, stop, start, stop, and, and go back it back again for sure. Okay, so um, so I talked about like the three different ways that I shoot. Um, I don't just shoot Milky Way or star images. I actually love shooting in moonlight and twilight. Um, typically, a good moonlight and twilight shot would be if you have like fullish moon 
and you can get the moon rise or the moon set about 40 to 60 minutes before sunrise or after sunset, then what happens is the moon will underlight the clouds and you'll still get stars. This image actually has stars in it. I know nobody's going to believe me. It kind of looks like a sunrise or a sunset, but there is stars there. Um, but there was not very many stars because I was working on a project for 100 nights under the stars and I got 100 nights under the clouds instead. So, um, but yeah, <laughs> this one was shot um, definitely uh, during twilight slash moonlight with some stars. It's a blue hour blend. The foreground was shot at F11. Um, I was a little bit late shooting the foreground, so I was at a higher ISO 400 for 30 seconds. And then I have additional shots um, for as the clouds moved across the scene. Um, and the sky I shot at F4 for six seconds at ISO 3200. Um, so that one's not a stacked sky. But there's a lot of images that go into something like this. Like I think this one's five or six images I'll put together. Um, so one of the easy things about this shot was that I was standing really far back from any of my foregrounds, so I didn't really have to worry about focus stacking and that kind of stuff. Okay, so we'll get more into the nitty gritty here with some planning and tools. I did promise you some Photoshop, or sorry, PhotoPills. So PhotoPills has some really, really awesome features. One of them is the planner. So in this one, you can hit load and you can find a location or you can use it on location where you are um, and it'll show you how the Milky Way core lines up with your point of interest so a mountain or whatever. Um, I used PhotoPills to find where the Milky Way lined up in that shot that I showed you with the Aurora just a few minutes ago. Um, here's the how PhotoPills determined where the Milky Way was going to be. And then I just ended up getting Aurora off to the left, which was a special bonus. Um, so PhotoPills is really good for determining if you're going to go out Milky Way shooting, um, where the Milky Way is going to line up in relation to your uh, location or your point of interest. And um, you can also use this um, night mode, this night AR, to actually kind of superimpose during the day. You can change the time to show where the Milky Way is going to line up at exactly what time. So that makes it really easy to, I mean, if you can find clear skies anyway, to line up the Milky Way. <laughs> I guess that's 90% of the battle, isn't it? No clouds. You can, yeah. How can you tell I have just like a little bit of PTSD over that? that yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the thing that I use pretty much every single night shoot is um, I use photo pills function called spot stars. It's this uh, little function here on the main menu under pills. And then you can go in and you can enter your camera. So in this example, I use the Sony a7 III. You can enter your focal length and your aperture, and it'll give you a couple of values. So the first value is going to give you is a default value. Um, and that would be barely noticeable star trails. So if you were to post your picture online, nobody's going to see that your stars are trailing just a tiny little bit. If you wanted to um, blow up that photo and have it hanging somewhere, then um, you're probably going to want this more accurate number, um, which is usually half of what the default number is. But this will give you pinpoint stars, so it works really, really well. Um, and it just takes into account your sensor, your camera, your your aperture, your focal length. Focal length um, has a really, um, it's really important for determining the length of your shutter opening because the longer the focal length, the more trailing you get with the stars. So you want ideally really short exposure times. Um, nine seconds is kind of like the upper end of where I might be shooting. And nine seconds is largely because I'm on a wide, this one's showing a wide focal length, 16 millimeters, and then the F4 is, um, it's, you know, is a more narrow aperture. And so in combination with the camera that I'm using, that gives me nine seconds. Um, but typically I'm, I'm actually shooting somewhere between three and six seconds on most of the time. So now you can imagine if I'm only shooting for three to six seconds, 
and it's dark outside. And even if I'm at f2.8, right. I'm probably not getting a lot of light into the camera. No. <laughs> if that's the case, then I need to be pushing the ISO. Um, and there's that's why I would use um, programs for stacking for noise reduction, um, because I can push the ISO really high to do that. Uh, Good so far? Yeah, question on photo pills, which I, yeah. I won't understand. Uh, do you use the MPF rule or the 500 rule? Mm. Okay, <laughs> so the one I just showed you was the NPF rule. Okay, so that's so the that's barely the noticeable N stars. Yeah. yeah, and what they're doing here is they're giving you the comparison to the old 500 rule. I think the 500 rule used to be more effective because our camera sensors weren't very good. Um, right now, the technology that goes into our cameras makes them super machines. And um, if you were to use the 500 rule and you had a focal length of 16 millimeters, the old 500 rule would say that you could open the shutter for 31 seconds. If I did that with these settings, I would have massive trailing. Right. So they put it in there for your for your comparison, but it's really not very accurate with the the advancements in technology that we have today. Got it. Okay. Huh? Excellent question. Because <laughs> okay. like all these questions I have, you know, I'm I'm in a totally different place here because I normally understand questions, but all of the the nightscape star based things are, uh, are tricky. Um, actually, we're going to have another one because I kind of understand it. Uh, where was it? It was. It was. I can't find it now. Um, maybe, maybe I got rid of it. It was a question. Um, said, I try and remember it. I'm going to possibly look like an idiot. Um, <laughs> Are you comfortable with exposures 20 to 30 seconds without using an astrostat, if that was the correct technical term? Um, so I, so my biggest thing when I'm photographing stars is that I want them to be pinpoints. Right. Uh, when I'm doing the foreground, I'm usually at 30 seconds or a couple of minutes or whatever. Okay. Um, so it's I'm always working looking at each part of the scene. So I look at the stars. What do I, what, what kind of exposure do I need to photograph the stars correctly? Then I work down from there. Um, how dark is my landscape? What kind of exposure do I need um, to get the mountains and the trees and everything like that correctly exposed? And typically that's a much longer exposure and often wider apertures. Um, or I can shoot it during blue hour, like I've been kind of talking about so far. Um, and then I go, I work right to my foreground. You know, do I need to shoot this at 30 seconds? Do I need to focus stack it? I work through each individual part of the scene because seldom ever do I get a shot all in one. So a shot all in one is going to work if you are super far away. Like let's imagine we're standing on, you know, the edge of a mountain and there's a valley below us and, you know, mountaintops and stars um, off in the distance. I could do that at, at a wide aperture and get everything all pretty, pretty good. Um, but the minute I put something right next to my camera lens, I need to focus stack. So it's really about working through the whole scene. Right. You know, got it. Makes sense? Yep, okay. it does. <laughs> and sorry, Philippos, for kind of gobbling your... Uh question there but i think i think the answer makes sense to me so there we go okay <laughs> all right so um everybody's always curious about the apps that i use i'm going to run through a few of them um this one my favorite app is windy uh it looks like this and um what i love about it is um it has a couple of different weather models so there's a north american weather model there's a european weather model and i can compare those models they almost never agree, and um, I have a lot of trust issues when it comes to the weather. <laughs> but um, so one of the really fantastic things is I can set my favorite points or points of interest, and then I can figure out what the cloud cover looks like. I can move through the time here at the bottom, so I can plan, you know, as much as you can plan for weather in the Canadian Rockies. I can look at a certain time and see what the cloud cover is going to look like in a particular location. I can also divide that uh, or like mm, not divide it, uh, look at either just the low clouds, the medium clouds or the high clouds. I can it when he does a lot of things, it'll give you amount of precipitation. 
Um, it'll tell you if there's fog. There's, it does all kinds of things, but I use it most for looking at cloud cover. And um, it's, you know, kind of a, a shoe in for me for night photography if I get two weather models that agree with each other. Um, but anyway, so Windy is like my sort of go-to for, um, for weather planning. Um, Aurora apps, people are just crazy about Aurora apps. Um, <laughs> one of the ones that I use is Space Weather Live. So this used to be just a, um, a online thing, but now they have an app. Anyway, it's pretty cool. So it'll show you what the current conditions are. You can look at sort of the long-term forecasts as much as we can plan for Aurora. Aurora forecasts are really tricky because it's kind of like weather, only less reliable. So um, if you've ever complained about, you know, the weather forecast being inaccurate, try planning for the Aurora. Um, it's it's about as, as good. Um, and the other one that I use is my Aurora forecast, I think it's called. And um, what I like about this one is it will give you alerts. You can set your alert to be, say, a KP4. Um, when I'm in Iceland, I can set it at a KP4. When I'm home, I can set it at a KP5, and that gives me a good idea of when I'm going to see a strong storm. Um, so this one is like pretty easy information to digest as well, and um, I find that it works really well. I think most people really enjoy that app. Um, if you're interested in learning more about sort of the science behind what goes into predicting an aurora, then Space Weather Live is going to be a really good app for that because it'll tell you more details, um, more of the scientific details that help us to predict Aurora. So that's the, the name of that is Space Weather Live. I'm just uh, Googling yeah. links for for people. And what we can do is actually, um, Rachel, you can give me a, a bunch of links at some List point links. and I'll just yes. uh, I'll tag them on the recording or put them in the okay. recording uh, details so people can can uh, write it all down as well. But I've, I've found some yeah. of them. <laughs> okay. Awesome. That's good. Um, I was actually hoping we could do that. Yeah. All right. So um, just a little note on capturing the aurora. It's much like photographing the stars at any other time, but auroras can become very bright, which is going to affect our shutter time and our ISO more specifically. Um, this image was shot at f8. It was focus stacked. Each image, each image that went into the stack was shot at 30 seconds at ISO 3200 um, because it was shot at night, because it was there was a lot of moonlight and I wanted every ounce of detail on that foreground, which was utter magic. This is in Iceland um, and these frost flowers were the size of serving trays. They were so big um, and just so cool. Um, so I was running two cameras and literally running around like a child in a candy store squealing with delight um, and this ended up being one of my favorite images so when you have ambient light you know you can have those narrower um, apertures and as long as the part of the image that you're shooting in this case the foreground isn't moving you can open up the shutter as long as you want I didn't have the trigger on this camera I had it on another camera so I was limited to that 30 seconds um, but I did uh, do a very similar shot on um, on my 12 millimeter lens, and I did the foreground at f18 for four minutes, I think. And um, I actually liked this one better. Um, but the f18 shot was a single image, and once you kind of get past f16, um, you might get more depth of field, but the image quality isn't quite the same as you would get in sort of the mid range of your apertures. So Image quality wise, usually F8 to F11 is preferred. And as you move up towards F22, you're going to lose a little bit of quality. So that's a side note. OK, cameras. I'm a Sony shooter. I love my Sony cameras. I'm going to um, go over some of my favorite features. And um, yeah, the first one is called bright monitoring. It's basically like having night vision on your camera. It's not good for focusing. You can't focus with it. But what it does is it the camera boosts the gain internally and allows you to see your image in really amazing detail. So I'll play you a little clip 
this is what the back of my camera looked like when I was shooting that um, Aurora shot that I just showed you. Um, you can see that I was working at very short shutter times, f uh, three or sorry, shutter time of 3.2 seconds, f2.8, and ISO 3200. Um, so for this one, I was focused on the stars, but I want to show you what bright monitoring looks like on the back of a Sony camera because it really helps us to find our foreground really easily. That's it's super quiet. I think I've probably turned down the volume on my computer, but I'll just tell you what's happening. So all I've done is pressed a button on the back, on the top of my camera where I have bright monitoring set. And this is the live display. So you can see the Aurora moving a little bit. It's kind of like having a video with a bit of lag. And what it enables me to do is quickly find a foreground and set up without doing test shots and then going back and correcting something and then doing another test shot or hunting with my headlamp or whatever. It's, it's amazing. Um, I do have a link on my website if you are a Sony shooter um, on how to set it up. I, I do have some slides here. I'm going to kind of skip over them quickly in the interest of time. Um, but this is probably one of my absolute favorite features for is that um, night photography. A Sony specific feature, Rachel? Or it's, it's, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty. Sorry, sorry, everybody else, but this is only on a Sony. <laughs> only Sony's. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, this night I was actually shooting with my friend David. Um, this is last year in Iceland, and he was really struggling to find a composition and I set up two cameras and then I was like, I came over and I'm like, can I help you? Um, and he just switched to Sony this week. So <laughs> he said this is one of the features that, that got him most interested in Sony. Um, it's just really amazing. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna skip over this. This is how you would set it up. But if you are watching this back later, then this is how you would find it. It has to be set on a custom button, otherwise, it, you, you can't find it in a menu system. So you have to set it up on a custom button. And for me, that's a C2 on the top of my camera. Another feature that I love, um, which is on lots of cameras, is interval shooting. So I might set up interval shooting um, to do a time lapse, or I might set up interval shooting to do um, uh, the star stacking. So if I want to do my 20 images and I set my shooting interval to be one second, then I know that I've got a consistent interval and I'm going to be able to stack those images afterwards. Um, also on a Sony, for all of you who um, struggle with your indicator light on the front, if you turn on interval shooting and you shoot, you just set it for one second with a, like a one second delay and a one second sh uh, or set it to take one shot, it'll turn off that front light. So tip for you. Um, I know that if you're out shooting in a group, which we're probably not doing right now, but um, <laughs> if you I'm are safe. shooting in a group and you have an orange blinky light, it, it's in everybody else's shot. And so it makes most people pretty crazy and we try and turn it off. So you can put some gaffer tape over it or you can, you can use this quick little cheat. Okay. I'm almost there and uh, haven't started editing and um, we're at 1048. So this is great. Um, <laughs> we, this we is kind this of the last, the last thing that we promised um, was my favorite accessories. Um, the Luxley Viola is a light from b &H Photo that has 99 different brightness settings. You can set it to any color temperature that you want and you can also set it to being whatever brilliant color that you want. So not just a color temperature, but you can choose a color. Um, I use this if I need to light up a foreground or especially if I'm doing time lapse because sometimes the foreground just doesn't have enough light to, um, or maybe the inside of an arch or something like that. And you wanna highlight some detail. Uh, the Luxley Viola is really great for that. I do advocate for preservation of dark skies. I don't love um, having really bright lights. I love that this one can be set at the lowest brightness setting and it's probably not going to interfere, interfere with anybody else's viewing of the night sky. So uh, this one's like, um, it's always in my bag. I have two that are this size and then I have one that's a little bigger um, and I take them with me everywhere. So this is one of my favorite things for night photography. Um, I recently got a hold of an Atlas pack. Mine's the Athlete. I don't think I've ever loved a backpack so much as I love this one. Um, when I first got it, I have to say that I didn't 
love it. I I unboxed it. <laughs> I opened it up and I tried to put my my two, uh, 70 to 200 in and with the the collar on it and everything, it just like the the little compartments are really flat. So that means that instead of sitting something in on its side, you have to sit it in flat. And my the first lens I tried to put in there didn't look like it went out. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> probably not going to use this <laughs> very much. Um, and then I was out. I, I wanted to do a, a hike. And I carry three bodies with me right now. But it, sh- it sounds excessive, but it's maybe not as excessive as you think. Um, I do. I, I love having one body devoted to time lapse, one that I can shoot with, and then I have a third body that I've been carrying around with me for video. So this pack, I can actually load three bodies with lenses in the main compartment where the camera sits, and I can just reach in there and grab whatever I want. And then the sort of the bulkier part of it, uh, you can put your camera or your sorry or your lens into one of the, the, you know, the little sleeves that they come in and you can stuff it down in there. I can bring anything I need to be hiking. I can bring my snacks, warm clothes, um, ice cleats, uh, helmets, like whatever I need. I can get so much stuff in there. And the thing that I love about it the most is not only are the shoulder straps super comfortable, but the weight sits really close to my back. So when I'm hiking, I'm not being like, pull over. So if I have to scramble or something like that, um, my weight is really close to my body. So all the heavy stuff, the camera gear sits right next to my back and then all the lighter stuff is on the outside. So I love this pack. I've never loved a pack as much as I love this one. Um, anybody who's ever taken a workshop with me in the Rockies, especially, I pretty much make them buy these gloves. (laughs) Uh, These gloves are made by the heat company. They are the warmest things I've ever tried. I don't go anywhere without them. Um, This particular set was the very first set that I got and it had like a a liner glove sort of built into the mitten. um, And now those are sold separately. But basically it's a like a liner glove and then the mitten has pockets for hand warmers. They are really good protection from uh, the wind and elements. Um, they have the little like cuff so that you can strap them on like like you did in kindergarten, um, which sounds really awkward. But if you go out shooting at a place like Abraham Lake where the wind is kicking off at 80 miles an hour and you make the mistake of taking off your glove, it's still attached to you and it won't blow away. Um, yeah, so these gloves are super warm. I've um, I got frostbite like five years ago, six years ago, and it never really goes away. And um, I've never had a problem, at least with my fingers, since I got these gloves. And I've been using them for, I think, about four years now. So if you are in a cold condition or cold climate, these are the gloves for you. And and they're Uh, they're powered as well? Sorry if I missed that. No, no, I put chemical warmers in. So um, these, like these ones, so these ones are the foot ones. I don't. I can't live without my chemical warmers because I'm pretty much cold-blooded. I think I don't. I don't think I actually produce my own body heat. But um, so in my boots, I really like to have the insole style. But Hot Hands also makes like the little chemical warmers that you can stick in your gloves, and that's what I stick in my Heat Company gloves. Got it. Right. And then lastly is my tripod. I use um, slick tripods. The one I have pictured here is the 734. It's kind of a, a mid-range, super lightweight for hiking and stuff, but it's still sturdy enough to do everything I need it to do. Um, I also have a really short one. I think it's called the DXS 500, but it's really short. Like it gets really low to the ground. It can sit flat on the ground, and I love that one too. So I have a few different models, but I just love that they're super durable. They're really light for hiking and because I carry three bodies, I'm usually carrying at least two tripods, and um, it's not it's not bad to carry them weight wise. Okay, that's that's like everything I promised except for the editing. <laughs> and we did say we'd Woo! overrun as well, but as I said, it's important, yeah. and we've got time on our hands. I'm just going to ask you a couple of um, equipment uh, questions. Um, yeah. So battery life and sort of dealing with cameras in the cold. 
Um, obviously, yeah, extreme cold, it can be an issue. Um, yeah. So any any tips on that or ways to abate it? Oh, man. Um, okay, so right now all of my cameras are the Sony Mark III, and the battery life on those things is absolutely incredible. I can shoot at... Um, uh, minus 20 Celsius for six hours, get 1800 frames in a time lapse before a battery will die. But before that, on the Mark IIs, the battery life was so, so, so bad. <laughs> uh, they were small batteries and they got cold super easy. And there were times when I would have to constantly change my battery out and then warm it up and then change and then exchange it for another one that was warm. Um, and that might happen every 20 minutes or every 10 minutes if it was really, really cold. So um, in the past, I would keep my batteries, you know, inside my jacket or um, with my hand warmers, those gloves, you can actually put a battery in there. Like if your batteries aren't too huge, mm. um, all of my batteries will fit inside my gloves with my hand warmers and stuff. So that helps. You can put your glove in your pocket with hand warmers as well. And, or sorry, your glove, your battery, <laughs> put your battery in your pocket uh, with hand warmers. And um, yeah, so keeping the batteries warm helps a lot in cold conditions. Um, and, and in terms of the camera, like my cameras run absolutely fine in the cold. I think I had a picture um, of my camera out oh, here. With ice crystals. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of those nights when I was out um, time lapsing and I went back to the car to stay warm but my camera was uh, just an absolute beast. Um, it got frost all, all over the outside, but it didn't get any on the lens element. And most of the time that doesn't, I don't get frost on the lens itself, but it happened two days ago and I was absolutely crushed because I loved my shot. And then I was actually just complaining to David about this. Um, the, it was so crisp everywhere except for right in the center i must have had a like a spot of ice, ice on the lens <laughs> because it made the stars blurry and it was such a beautiful location it was such a beautiful spot i had frost flowers Ugh, i'm just totally crushed that that happened um so it's not typical but um it does happen every once in a while you can tape the chemical warmers to the lens to try and keep it warm or some people build like little cozies for them and stuff and uh, i think the better thing is to just be really mindful that if you're getting frost on your camera chances are you're getting frost on your lens clean it um and try and keep the the ice off um, and i think there's also i haven't tried these but i've heard about like little rings like warm they're like somehow some little ring that you can put on on your lens to try and keep your lens element warm as well typically the cameras are just fine it's just keeping ice off the lens that's the, the that's the concern Got and it. battery life yeah and, keep those batteries and quite a few people are asking as you're kind of scrabbling around in the dark all the time um the the bright monitoring is great of course but but what about uh focusing like is is the camera able to mm. focus or or how are you or how are you so I'm manually that. focused. Yeah. Yeah, I'm manually focused. Okay. Um, it's pretty easy to focus on the stars as long as there's enough light. Um, you just find the brightest star in the sky. I use focus magnification. I'm in manual focus. I I magnify in um, to 12.4 times magnification. Right. And then I just turn the the focus wheel until I get the sharpest star. And so focusing on anything in in the sky is typically pretty easy but on really dark nights no you it's really hard to focus so yeah. um one of the things you can do is um so on my camera when i turn the focus wheel i'll see like a little hmm, let's call it a ruler at the bottom there's <laughs> um, a picture of a person on one side and a mountain on the other side so the mountain being closer to infinity the person being closer to you uh, to the camera and um, and it'll actually tell me my focal distance. So it might be six meters or it might be infinity or whatever. Got it. So if there's not enough light to focus. Once I have my focus on that distant thing, if I need to focus stack, I can just back the wheel off and go in increments. Um, and experience helps with this quite a bit. 
um, but you would get your focus stack that way and then make sure that your closest point to you that you've focused it and you can you can do that by shining your headlamp on your foreground and focusing manually there but yeah fo focusing can be really tough at night yeah no easy way around it i guess yeah no nope. <laughs> okay editing okay editing <laughs> yeah let's do it okay so i'm going to attempt to minimize this And oh, that's me. <laughs> and, oh, wait, and this? Okay. And I'm going to pull up Capture One. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, the shot that I wanted to work through today is um, it's an exposure blend and a focus stack. And the focus stacked foreground I shot during blue hour, kind of late blue hour, but still blue hour. Um, and the it's not really done. I just started working on it yesterday. Let's see if I can show you. It's kind of roughly that. So um, this is kind of where I got to with it yesterday. I'd probably spend another couple of days fine tuning it, but I'm going to try and get us this far with with the shot today. So I um, to do the um, the stars, I had to run this through Starry Landscape Stacker. I took my 20 images and I stacked them for noise reduction. This was, you can see um, uh, somewhere, my settings, um, but it was shot at 20,000 ISO for 10 seconds at F4 and it's really dark, right? So my challenge is to bring up the exposure, not blow out those stars, um, work with the color, I don't remember what my um, what my white balance was set at, but white balance is a really important thing at night. Um, I find that in the Rockies, if I'm shooting really close to sunrise or sunset, I like a warmer white balance. Or if I'm shooting in moonlight, I like a warmer white balance. But if I'm in the middle of the night, I like it to be cooler. That's just a preference. Um, so we need to somehow work with this sky and bring up the exposure and, you know, um, I'm not going to be worried about anything in the ground. I'm only going to be worried about the sky. Super dark, isn't it, for 20,000 ISO? Yeah. So, this, so this shot is just your sky shot. Yeah. yeah. This is this is the raw shot, but it's already 20 stacked. So it's Got been it. stacked for noise reduction, and it's in the form of a TIFF. Got it. OK. Um, so actually, you can see um, at the bottom of my screen here what the ISO is. Uh, ISO 20,000, 10 seconds, F4. And I was at 13 millimeters. Apparently, um, I must have knocked my my focus ring. So, or my, my focus ring knocked the um, the zoom. Okay. So then I went ahead and I shot the. Um, this is the blue hour shot of the foreground. I have to admit that this day I was very excited because the conditions were absolutely stellar, um, and I had two cameras set up and they were about. I don't know, 20 feet apart. So I was like forest gumping between two cameras trying to get a 30 second shot on this one and then move to the other one and get a 30 second shot. And I was, you know, just uh, very excited uh, and very out of breath by the time blue hour was over. Um, so I didn't shoot this in, in a very methodical way because I was working on two cameras. Typically you want to work from back to front or from front to back. And that'll help um, if we're doing things in Photoshop, for example, to uh, help Photoshop focus stack those images because they're in order. Um, I'm going to show you what I mean in just a sec. So basically, um, I need to start working on the sky first and, and figure out what I want that to look like and the color tones and stuff. And then I need to somehow match this, which is, I mean, it's bright, it's... Um, it's purple. <laughs> it's there's a, you know we have a lot of work to do. Um, and ideally, what I what I need to do is get the images close enough in their color tone and close enough in their luminance that I can blend them together initially, and then I can start working on bringing out the color. And I'm I love color separation, especially for Milky Way shots. You can see even it's so dark. There's some kind of um, light pollution on the horizon, which I don't mind at all in this shot. Um, and we'll see once we start um, bringing up the exposure and whatnot that um, there's actually a lot of detail here. So 
we'll start with that. We'll start with exposure and just have a look at what we're actually able to see. Um, with Sony's, you can bring up the exposure a little over two stops, maybe two and a half stops before you're going to start having issues with um, like weird things in the shadows and whatnot. So I think I'm going to bring it up about two stops. Maybe just a little higher. Okay. Um, I want to be careful with highlights here. Um, highlights are really important to preserve. I really don't want to blow out the stars. Um, I am going to bring the highlights down a little bit, and I'm going to bring the shadows up. Um, and you've you've minimized my face here, right, David? <laughs> um, we can still see you. Are, are you worried about you're in the peering phase now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So my concern is that um, I'm editing on a really small screen. Usually I have like a second monitor set up, but for the purposes of the Skype and, and everything, um, I don't have my big monitor. So everything is really small and I don't want to stick my face right in the screen <laughs> and have you guys all looking at my forehead. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try and avoid that. Well, I'll hide you. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, exposure-wise, I've brought it up like about two stops, and um, I've brought up the shadows a little bit. Again, I'm just going to keep reiterating, I don't care about anything here, except that I am I am concerned about the color. So um, I don't want my snow to be super blue or super, super purple or whatever. I'd kind of like it to be more or less white or, you know, as if, um, as if I was shooting, yeah as if you were seeing it during the day. Um, it will get a color cast to it, like a like a cool color cast, but anyway. Okay, so um, I think on this one, I actually brought up the contrast a little bit too, just to bring out the stars. Um, I brought down the highlights and I brought up the shadows. So I'm gonna bring down the highlights. I just wanna preserve those all the way through and make sure that I'm not blowing out any of the stars. And then I want to start working on the color. So color is something that I do in layers. Um, this one, I'm going to make it a little bit cooler. I, I like cooler, like, you know, the cool tones, the blues and, and magentas. And I usually bring up the tint just a little bit. So the very loveliest thing about Capture One is the ability to really work with color. And that's why I love it so much. So working through, so I've made a sort of a basic adjustment here to the color temperature. This is not anywhere close to what I want it to look like in the end, but what I'm going for is color separation. I see I've got some, some warmer tones here. The warmer tones are kind of spreading into the Milky Way. There's some cooler tones up here. And then, you know, this is maybe a bit of light pollution on the horizon that's making that kind of pink off in the right-hand corner. So I... Um, I want to work with the blues a little bit. I'm going to just like bring down the hue of the blue. And uh, I think even bringing down the saturation just a tiny little bit on the blues. Um, it's really easy to just sort of like puke color onto an image. And I try not to do that. Um, I really like contrasty images I, um, and I love saturated colors. Um, lots because I have um, really poor vision. Most people don't know this, but I'm borderline legally blind in my left eye. And so images for me that, that, that resonate with me the most are the ones that I can see best. So I tend to lean towards those contrasty images with really good, vibrant colors. But I don't want to overdo it either. Okay. So I've just made some really basic adjustments um, in the color editor. Then I can go into the advanced tab. Advanced is really awesome because let's say I want to work with my snow here. This isn't the image I'm actually going to work with snow. Maybe I'll actually choose the sky. So I want the sky to be a little bit more blue. I can use the, the picker to choose the color that I want to work on. Um, this is the color range that the picker selected. Um, and then I can go in and adjust just that color. So I can work with the um, saturation if I want to, or I can work with the smoothness, I can work with the hue. So I want it to be a little bit more blue. And 
um, and all I've really affected is that particular blue, right? Um, okay, so I've stacked this all for noise reduction, and um, I did it, and the imaging, whatever we call it, the algorithm did a pretty good job. I'm going to zoom in there so you can really see. Oops, that's too big. So when I'm looking at closer details of my images, I'm really wa not wanting to go um, much beyond 100% because otherwise you start getting like really pixelated looking stuff. So I'm going to show you what, um, what it looks like at F4. And um, you can see that the stars are really pretty sharp. Um, this is a 12 millimeter lens, so there's a little bit of um, coma on the stars, especially in the corners. But it's pretty clean. Um, I did want to maybe bump up the noise reduction just a little bit. So um, I'm going to go in here and give it a little bit of uh, luminance. I'm not going to worry about sharpening or anything. I've kind of edged away from sharpening my images, um, especially while I'm working. Um, and the reason being is that our cameras capture things really sharp, like way sharper than the human eye sees things. And I find that sometimes things just look like too much. And so I try to think about sharpening as what's necessary for for the image and for um, for how people are going to see it. So if I was going to print this, then I would look at sharpening for print once I'm all done. But I'm not going to worry about sharpening right now. How, how okay. do you find the uh, the defaults in Capture One? Are they generally working all right on the raw files? Yeah, 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 um, like a hundred percent. So you can tell I haven't I haven't touched it, but I but I like the look of it. So I'm not worried about you know, resetting anything or going back to zero. I'm just not adding any any sharpening. Got it. Defaults are good. Okay, so this is kind of where I got to. Um, and let's see. Um, so a little note about editing. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to reproduce something that you've done in the past, but <laughs> it's, totally it's nearly impossible. <laughs> impossible. It, it, like even if you write down the values and you slide the sliders exactly where you had them before, it's next to impossible. Yeah. So um, I'm going to get a really close approximation of what I ended up with, and uh, and then you can see kind of what my 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 workflow is. So I have my star image roughly, and now I need to edit um, this. <laughs> so the challenge is to get the color tones to match. Like one is purple, one's kind of got more white, sort of bluish snow. Um, this is going to, this is going to be a little bit of work, right? Um, so for the, um, white balance here, I need to, uh, start looking at the Calvin. Okay. Another thing that I did on this image because I was running around like a crazy person. Um, I don't think it was very consistent with my exposures because I would go to one and then I would go to the other and then I'd come back and it would be too bright. So. Yeah, it kind of turned out weird. This is how, um, this is where I want to get to so that the snow kind of matches the tones here. And I just do this by eye. There's somebody coming by my house with a snowblower right now. <laughs> I love working from home. <laughs> Sorry about the noise. Um, okay, so we need to adjust the colors here. Um, we're going to start with the Kelvin. And I'm going to actually make this a little bit. Warmer. I want the purple out of the snow is like for me the biggest thing. Um, and the tint, I'm going to actually bring that down. So already that's like a pretty nice change there. And then I can go in and refine that a little bit more um, with, the, with the color. Okay, so... Um, Basic. I can't remember if I actually adjusted any of the basic stuff. I think maybe a little bit of the blue. So the hues maybe brought down the blue hues just a tiny bit and just a tiny bit on the saturation too. Um, and maybe just a little bit more than that. Yeah, so now I'm kind of like the snow is starting to look more white, right? And 
it's still pretty bright, like the luminance of it is really bright. And I can go into the advanced color tab here and, oops, <laughs> helps if I'm on the right image, <laughs> the advanced color tab. And I can start like working with the snow uh, specifically. So if I bring down the hue again, let's see how we're doing. It's getting closer, right? So I'm just kind of eyeballing it back and forth. Obviously, this exposure is a lot darker. Um, I'm going to have to deal with the exposure as well. So maybe let's go there next. And I can bring the exposure down on this one. Oops, not this one. <laughs> this one. <Lord laughs> I can bring the exposure down on the image I'm working on. How about that? Yeah. Um, OK, and brightness looks pretty good maybe bring the highlights down a little bit. Um, I just wanted to show you something interesting. On the, on the stacked image, there's a reflection here in the ice from the light, probably a combination of the light pollution and, and whatever. And we're seeing that also in this image, it's just brighter. So I'm gonna have to tone that down on the final image just so that it doesn't look like quite so bright, but it was there in the actual night shot. Okay, um, and then because I'm working with the snow, I actually want to bring up the clarity just a little bit and maybe the structure just a little bit um, because I want all of these details. So this is kind of where I'm getting to. I know I still need to make some adjustments, but they're getting a lot closer. Maybe the exposure could still come down on this one. Um, but I'm just kind of eyeballing it. And what I'm trying to do is get the color tones and the exposure to be much closer together so that when I put them all together, um, they're not really contrasty and far apart and look like they were shot at different times. Um, I, there's eight shots here or something like that that I focus stacked. It looks like more because um, I have both um, the raw files and uh, PSD copies of them. So what I'm going to do is actually just um, when I've got the image where I want it to be in terms of the foreground, I'm going to copy that to my other images that I'm going to stack. So up here in the top right hand corner, you can select copy. That's going to copy all the settings. And then you can click the next image and, and hit apply and then you can have this, you know, as long as you shot it, as long as you shot it at all a consistent exposure and white balance, then it'll blend together or, you know, that'll come out really well. <laughs> I didn't. I had to do some little adjustments. And so therefore, I'm going to show you where I got to. So then all we want to do is open up all the images that we want to stack in Photoshop. So starting with the sky, we can go in here and edit with Adobe Photoshop. Okay. To save you guys from seeing my wheel spinning um, and my <laughs> computer chugging shots. along, yep. <laughs> I have already brought it into Prepared Photoshop. Earlier. Nice. Right. Okay. So I'm going to just kind of show you um, um, how I worked through this, and then I'm going to show you the, the details. So I'll give you an overview right now, and then I'll show you details. Here's the sky image that I brought in from Capture One. Then I brought in all the focus stacked foreground. There's like eight shots or nine shots or something like that. Then I use Photoshop to align these layers. I'm going to show you that. Then I use focus, uh, sorry, Photoshop to um, stack the images. Um, and then it gives me like a single image, um, which I then uh, can blend with my sky. So now here's my sky. Um, I have to create a mask to mask out the sky on the foreground image so that it can then be added to uh, the other sky image. And then I also sometimes use like a gradient layer in between the foreground and the sky to help blend that all together. Does that make sense? It does, yes. <laughs> OK. We're going to see it in action here in just a sec. OK. Um, all right. And then so once I kind of have everything all put together more or less, I take it back to Capture One. 
and I work on the colors a little more. And this is a thing where I can literally spend days working on little tweaks and little adjustments. And because yesterday was my first day looking at this image, I haven't done that. So this will probably not be what it looks like in the very, very end. But for now, I'll run you through exactly how this works. Okay, so I am going to just turn off a couple layers here for you. So again, I've brought in my sky shot from Capture One. Then I brought in these um, uh, foreground layers. I've gone into Photoshop once I, once I have everything in here. And so how I get them all on kind of like into layers is I will go to the image and I'll go up here in the top, say layer, duplicate layer, and this is the image here that I'm looking at. It's numbered 1005 PSD. So I will then send it to the shot that I'm working on. So if I send them all to the same place, which is actually it's the one labeled demo, um, all I have to do is select this, hit OK, and Photoshop will, will send that file and, and um, add them as layers. Um, I also label my layers, or mostly label my layers. Apparently, it didn't quite translate here today. <laughs> but, um, so I've labeled my sky, and then here's my foreground, um, or yeah, sky mountain. I went sky mountain, so 109 and 108. And then for whatever reason, because I was going back and forth between two cameras like a crazy person, um, I ended up working working backwards, essentially. So I just had to change the order of my files. So that's why they go 109, 108, 101, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. So I've brought in my sky. I've, um, I've brought in my layers. I need to first align them. So I'm going to turn off this sky layer, and I'm going to select all of the foreground layers. Then I'm going to go into Edit, Auto Align Layers, and Photoshop generally does a pretty good job of this. So it's just going to line them all up because as you move your focal point in your image, the lens jumps just a little bit. So you can see all of this um, area around the outside here that's got some transparent pixels and stuff. That's where we're losing some edge of the, of the first image because we keep moving the focal point. Does that make sense? Yes, it certainly does. Okay. Cool. All right. So. I'm going to select auto align layers. Photoshop's going to chug for two to five minutes, depending on how powerful your processor is. And then the next thing that we want to do is stack them. So once it's aligned them, and I align it with the sky as well, um, then I have to go in here and do the same thing, auto blend layers. And when I do this, um, it's a stack. So I'm going to tell Photoshop to stack them together, click OK. Again, it'll chug for three to five minutes, maybe <laughs> 10 minutes, depending on how many images you use. And, and it will then spit out um, a, like a, a, a final thing where they're all together. So I'm going to select that so you guys can see when I zoom in really tight and um, I go down to the bottom. Look how sharp that is. The nice. foreground is really, really sharp, right? And um, I should have done it before I stacked all the images, but you can see when, when you have them all stacked like that, um, at F11, if you're focused on the mountain, the foreground's really fuzzy. It basically looks like the sky image. So let's just compare that to the sky. I mean, this was also extremely noisy, but look yeah. how blurry the foreground is because it was shot at F4, right, and focused on those stars. So now you can see huge difference, obviously. And you can actually see that the lens jumps a little bit there too. So each of these uh, little layers is an incremental, um, incremental focus point. And um, as I work away from the foreground towards the mountain, um, I need less and less points. But really close to the lens, I need more focal points. Good so far? Yep, definitely. And there was okay. a question earlier about um, the focus stacking sort of process, like when you're actually shooting it, um, right. how to determine how many 
focus points you need. Now I know there's a probably a billion ways to calculate it and a couple of cameras can automate that, but but what's what's yeah. your method? Um, okay, so a little bit of experience goes a long way here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're really wide open apertures, you can just think that basically you need all of the focal points you can possibly stand to sit there and take. Um, you know, at F28, I probably need somewhere between like 30 focal points. Got it. Uh, uh, if I was at F8, I might need six or eight. And it, like this really depends on how close your camera is to your foreground element. Again, right. if I'm standing on a, on a mountainside and I'm looking out in the distance, I don't need any focal points. Like it's all good. Um, it's just when I'm really close to a foreground like this, I have to have um, more. And if I'm at 2.8, that's a really shallow depth of field. And I probably need 12 in the first you know, meter between my camera and the and the distance. Um, if I'm at f8, I probably need say three or four. If I'm at f11, I probably need less. Um, I was really keen on getting this shot as perfect as I could get it because I loved it so 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 much. And so I did nine. And it might have been overkill, but I like having I like having more overlap than sure. less. It's better to um, have if uh, less overlap. Yeah. You might end up with a spot that's not in focus, and then you just be crushed that you've you know, sat out there in the cold and, and braved the, the deep snow. <laughs> uh, the, the day that I, well, the day before we shot this, actually, um, I had one of my favorite people ever out there with me. And uh, we kept, his name is Bruce, by the way. Um, he, we kept falling through the snow because the snow was really deep. So we were, we were post-holing. And uh, so one of our group was this tiny little woman who could run across the snow like it was no big thing. And me and Bruce and um, Laurel just kept falling through, falling through, falling through. And at one point I looked behind me and, and I see Lynn just like running across the snow and she's barely making a dent. And then I, and then just like, just behind her is Bruce. And there, I'm only actually seeing half of Bruce because he fell into snow like way steep. So <laughs> it was, comical to say the least anyway i showed him this picture yesterday and he he uh he said oh i'm pretty sure i'm in that picture i probably just fell through a post hole though so <laughs> nice okay so now um i've got everything aligned and i've got everything stacked so now it's sharp all the way through it's sharp right from this foreground right to the mountain and now i need to somehow magically replace the sky. I want to um, use the star image that I have. And so this gets a little complicated. There's lots of ways we can make masks, but I'm going to show you how I did this one. It does take a little bit of finessing. And so um, David's going to make sure that my face isn't on the screen yep. as I get really just close to it. Just switch to the, okay. wrong, uh, the wrong scene. So, okay. <laughs> but so I'll get rid of your I've face. Done, don't worry. What I've done here is um, after Photoshop has given me a, a combined layer. I basically hit shift, select everything, and then I hit shift, control, alt, E, called the claw, or shift, command, option, E, I think, on a Mac. And that will kind of like stamp a layer for me. So now if I mess up, I have all of those layers underneath. I can bring back something. Um, but basically, I'm just kind of starting on a fresh layer. OK? Good so far? Yep, for sure. All right, so I'm going to um, use channels to create a mask here. Um, first thing I need to do is, um, let me just make sure I'm on the right layer. Yes, I am. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is find one of these channels, um, when I already did it, but um, we're gonna pretend I haven't done it. Actually, yeah. Um, I'm gonna try and find the, the channel that gives me the most separation between the sky and the mountain. <clears throat> so you can see if I'm here in the blue, blue channel, there's a lot of, um, it kind of blends, the sky blends with the mountain, especially on that right-hand side. No big deal on the left-hand side, um, but that right-hand side's gonna give me troubles. So if I go into the green channel now, I've got a little bit more contrast there. Let's check the red. The red channel looks to me like it's going to be the most contrast. So I'm going to choose this channel. And this is the one that I'm going to make my mask from. So now I'm going to hit control and click on that channel. And it's going to give me some marching ants, I hope. There we go. OK, so now I want to save this as a channel, which is what I've done here. This alpha's one channel is 
the last mask I made and it's already saved. But I'm going to um, go down here to um, the layer icon and I'm going to hit this one. And now you can see I've got Alphas 2. So if I go into Alphas 2, um, here's all of my marching ants. Um, basically, it's just showing me areas of high contrast or high luminance. Um, and I'm going to adjust this to make a mask of the sky. First thing I'm gonna do is go to Image, Adjustments, and Levels. And I'm really going to, I'm, all I'm trying to do with this is try and find the most separation between the sky and the ground. So I'm going to bring up the lights. I'm going to bring down the darks. It's going to look totally horrendous. Don't worry about it. Um, and then I can use, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. That looks like pretty good separation to me. And so I still have these marching ants. Um, now I want to use my quick selection tool to select my sky. Um, I'm going to use the square bracket keys to make my brush larger and smaller. And up here, I'm just going to select my sky. So that's a really rough mask of the sky. I want to take out everything that's not the mask of my sky. So I'm going to hold down the Alt key and I'm going to go over all of this foreground stuff. Oops. And this does take patience. This is probably one of the things that'll take you the longest. I'm gonna then use Control Plus and get really tight in there. And I'm gonna have a really close look at the edge of the mountains and make sure that I'm selecting the mountains and not the sky. It's actually done a pretty good job so far. Oh, so now you can see that we've got some stuff here we need to get rid of. So I need, I just need to hit the Alt key and just try and push that line up a little bit. And I'm going to make my brush a little smaller now so I can fine tune this. Okay. Okay, so here you can see that it's not done a very good selection along the side of the glacier. So no Alt key this time because I'm in my mask. And I can just push that down. And then this one, hit the Alt key again so that I can select that little bit. And now that's really, really reasonably close. So. Um, I would spend more time on this if I was just working by myself, but to save you guys, I'm just going to pretend that I've done this mask <laughs> in its entirety. I'm going to put this one in the trash and hope that I haven't messed up my other mask. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, with my mask in place, I'm going to click on the RGB. I don't want to be on the Alphas channel. And then I'm going to go back to Layers. And, oh, wait, I've, I've skipped over something here. Sorry. Um, so once I have my mask, I'm going to go back to my mask here and turn all this stuff off. So the next thing I want to do before I continue is I want to make sure this mask is going to fit my foreground. So um, I want to go into Select, Modify, and Expand by two pixels. I'd hit OK, but I've already done this, so I'm just going to hit Cancel. Then I'm going to go to Select, Modify, and Feather by one pixel. And again, I've already done it, so I'm just going to hit Cancel. So that's going to allow me to blend a little easier between my sky and my foreground. So now I'm going to go to the RGB again. Um, I'm not going to select the Alphas channel, but you can see that um, my mask is here. So if I go into Layers, um, I now have my mask. So if I go ahead and hit, I've got a lot of layers going on here, so hopefully this works. <laughs> Trying to do it ahead of time. So I want to, um, so, so I want to be on my foreground, and then I want to add um, a layer mask. So I'm going to hit Alt and click to the layer mask icon, and this is going to give me my mask. So you can see that it's masked out the, the sky. What's underneath of it right now is just a copy of this image, so that's all you're seeing, but... Oh, 
Oh, Rachel, did we lose you? David? Oh, you're back, Rachel. Did you put us on hold? <laughs> <It's> just... Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I didn't touch anything. No, it just went just nope. went quiet for a second. But you're back. Don't worry. Okay. All right. So, um, I've just moved my sky image up. So here's my foreground with the with the blue hour sky. I've got my mask on, so I just have to slide the sky up underneath the mask, and now you can see that nice. um, I've got my stars combined with. It, this is sort of a, a really rough outline too, but the stars are now combined with the blue hour shot. Perfect. Still following? Round of okay. applause. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're a long ways from done, but I'm going to show you just a couple of things and then and how I would work with this, and then we'll call it a wrap for today. Cool. So one of the one of the ways that we can make this blend a little bit more seamless is to add a gradient. Um, I've already created a gradient, but I can throw a gradient on between. Um, the sky, the sky in the foreground, and then I can just lower or increase the opacity, um, and you can see that it just sort of helps to, mm, yeah. It, it looks more natural, I would say. Yeah, it looks yeah. a little more natural, a little less like a cutout. So at this point, I am going to basically collapse all of this down, make it a single, a single layer. Shift Control Alt E. And then I can take it back into Capture One and start working on my on, on the actual color, like the you know what it's going to look like more towards the end. All right, so that's like so that's the basics. I could wrap that up right now, or we could go back to Capture One and I could work on some color. Up to you. We can go back. That's fine. We've we've still got people in the room. It's not mass desertion. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sounds good. So now uh, going back to capture one, then um, I already brought this back. So um, I think when I brought it back, it was like really pink and I want it to be more blue, more nighttime. So again, I'm just going to go in here and start sliding sliders. Um, it's um, this is something that takes me a really, really long time. And I just work on little, little bits. I love the warmth in here. I love that warmth from the light pollution. I don't want it to look like light pollution, but I just want to, I want it to look like color separation. So now I can start working with little individual bits here. Um, I want to be in the color tab. Um, I could go ahead and choose, say, this pink, and I can start working with the hue of just the pinks. And I can really start to bring out the color. Um, this is a little bit too white to me, so I can start working with the hue there as well. Um, but I want to make sure that I don't end up doing weird things to it. So this is just a lot of really fine tuning um, that I'm going to work with this color. Maybe make this one more warm. Maybe make the sky more more blue. And honestly, this could take me days. So, uh, <laughs> and then you know, starting to work with like contrast and um, and luminance, and really trying to bring out certain bits of the image. But I I just kind of work things through one at a time. When I've kind of got the color more to a spot where I want it, I would bring it back into Photoshop to deal with this. Um, you know, there's a couple different ways I could deal with the brightness there. I could use the burn tool and try to make it a little bit darker, but I find that makes things a bit muddy. Um, I can use the clone tool and at a low opacity, just try and clone out or, you know, clone in say some of the snow over top to reduce the shininess there. Um, there's a few different ways that I could deal with that, but I definitely have to deal with it to get the image to where I want it. Um, yeah, anyway, well, that's kind of more or less what I would do with an image besides the three days I will spend fine tuning <laughs> Going backwards and forth, backwards and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah as I said to you yesterday or whenever it was, um, I, I ran out of patience very quickly. Um, and the thought of stacking a lot of pictures together is, you know, tricky for me. But, but watching you do this, of course, there's 
someone asked a question earlier actually can can you just do all this in one hit and there is really no way to get front to back focus with a wide aperture this is what i'm learning uh, because obviously you can't so you need to focus stack to get your focus correct and then of yeah. course you need your different exposure for the sky because that's way different to everything else so so to get the yeah. kind of shot that we see on screen now uh there is no other way to do it really until it's a big investment yeah. night shooting is a big investment if you have one camera body i mean i got two shots this night because i had two bodies with me right but um, you know, we got out there at four o'clock in the morning. We set up to capture the Milky Way. The Milky Way in my area in February was only visible for the core of it was only visible for about half an hour. Right. So we worked pretty quickly and it was cold. You know, we were working in some very, very chilly temperatures. Fingers are cold and everything. Um, we got our Milky Way shots and then we had to wait for blue hour. Um, and so we all went back to the car and huddled in there and kept warm for a few more minutes and <laughs> uh, and then ran back out for, for blue hour. It's incidentally very hard to make myself get out of the vehicle when I've been warm after I've been thawing out for an hour. Um, but yeah, imagine. so we go back yeah. out there and shoot. And this particular morning was so rewarding because we had perfectly clear skies for Milky Way. And then just before sunrise, all the clouds rolled in and we got fire out there. It was absolutely incredible. It was one of the most memorable mornings I've ever had and probably the most beautiful light I've ever seen out there. So it was a really, really special day. But it's a big, big investment. The planning that goes into it, the organization, right. trying to plan how you're going to shoot the shot and, you know, waiting out the time to get, you know, a blue hour shot. Like this shot took us from four o'clock in the morning you know, once we got out there, we had to drive to get there. So we drive for an hour and um, we got there at four o'clock in the morning and we weren't done our blue hour stuff until I think I want to say six or seven. I can't remember the times now because um, the sun's rising earlier and earlier every day. But it's a really, really big investment for one shot. And then to come home and edit it all together. This is like 29 shots or something. It's <laughs> yeah. it's a big project, you know, to put it all together. So when you're looking at a night sky image, Seldom ever are the, they are like a single shot, unless they're really dark. Like if you're looking at silhouettes of trees with a beautiful mm -hmm. aurora on top or something, that might be a single image. But something like this is really um, quite an effort to put together. Definitely. And I certainly learned that today as well. And then what we can also do, Rachel, between uh, the two of us is that we can um, maybe try to collate a list of some of the things we spoke about and then yeah. what we do is we put that <laughs> like, in uh, the YouTube comments as well so I, yeah. I did manage to, to quickly uh, throw a few up like um, photo pills and, and windy and a few other things but we can make a awesome. list um, or awesome. of course the um, you're also available as you said maybe you can bring up your website contact details I think it was yeah. slide one wasn't it of your presentation yeah. and then I'll put that up on screen and then if people want to screenshot or make a note or whatever then uh, they can go to that yeah mm -hmm. so a lot of my gear, I actually have I mean Ooh. more gear but I do Maybe have a, a page on my website um, it's just called my gear and then you can go through and see it's not it hasn't been updated in a few months so there's a few of uh, you know, missing lenses and my backpack's not on there, but uh, a lot of the stuff that I use is on there. So perfect. So you can go over to astrophotography.com and check out my gear list. Nice. And you can always send me a note with any questions, and I'm also available um, through social media. So if anybody's looking for me, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Um, Instagram is actually a really good way to message me. Um, I get a lot of DMs that way. Um, and you can also use the contact form on my website if you want to, you know, have a longer converse conversation or ask more in-depth questions. Yep. And, and and the consulting, of course, you offer as well. So, yeah. so there we go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Everything. Um, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me, you guys. That was, uh, yeah, just a tiny bit over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that was, well, it was record webinars uh, in many ways. So on duration and number of people <laughs> attending. So that's two, uh, yeah. that's, that's two records we hit today, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, so that's perfect. <laughs> I'm not sure about the duration, but 
you know, I was running over um, all the things that we promised people yesterday, and I was like, hmm, I haven't actually inserted a slide on my gear. So <laughs> I was updating last night and trying to and trying to add to it, and I knew it was already long. So Definitely. anyway, but oh, I'm glad we got it all Also, there. I've got to put it up, but a fellow called Scott Photo Pills are doing a masterclass soon, I think. So I'm just going to put awesome. that um, link up as well. If I can, I love photo pills. Let's try and make so that can't recommend them message. highly enough for. Yeah, for so they're shape. doing, a, I think, a webinar or a masterclass or something. So if you're into photo pills, you can look at that. But again, I'll stick that on a uh, on our useful set of links that we're going to put up somewhere as well. Careful. Cool. All right, Rachel. Thanks very much. Oh look, we can do use the cheesy <laughs> sound effect. <laughs> I'm doing uh, applause in the background, which we probably can't hear. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Rachel. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for hanging in, guys. Pleasure. And thanks for everyone uh, joining us around the world as well. So take care and see you all soon. Bye now. Bye. Take care.